Hello, everybody. My name is Christina, and together with Adrian, we will present you how we transform pictures into memories at Photobox. First, I will make an introduction about products at Photobox. Afterwards, we'll present our machine learning applications, and then Adrian will present uh, more detailed architecture choices uh, of our photo analysis system. Photobox is a leader of online printing products in Europe with more of uh, 1 billion photos uploaded on our server yearly. Unlike other e-commerce websites, our products depend on users' photos. Also, we are in charge of the entire production chain from uh, the software till physical products. The most important product at Photobox is the Photobox, but the steps to manually create one is yet a burden. The average time spent by a user um, is more than five hours, spread over 20 days. First, the user has to select the pictures one by one, if it is meticulous, drag and drop them into the right pages and by carefully arranging them into layouts, rescale the most important ones, add decoration and text if wanted. Machine learning is uh, really important for Photobox for its current and future products. One of the first applications is uh, photo cropping. If we use a straightforward uh, method of, of photo cropping, we may lose important information, uh, such as the subject of the photo. Therefore, uh, we want to uh, retain the most important information, the subject, and to discard uh, peripheral information. So why do we need this photo cropping? Is because we have to adapt to a specific product format. By analyzing the user cropping behavior, we sh it showed that um, users usually keep faces in their photos. Therefore, we have included a face detector in tool in our algorithm, and therefore uh, we can we are able to provide a more intelligent smart crop. <laughs> Another application is removal near duplicates uh, from photos. Here is the example of uh, two, photo, different, two different photo albums with the same photo set. In the first one, as you can see, uh, we have on a double page a lot of photos which are similar, and in the second one, we have photos which are unique. Of course, the best one is the last one, but how can we do this automatically? Because Nowadays, we can take a lot of photos with our smartphones or with our cameras because we have a lot of storage. I'll present some few examples of um, near duplicates, of what we consider near, near duplicates. We have implemented a, a method which uh, compares the features uh, of the photos in order to determine which photos are similar. In this case, we have uh, two photos which are quite similar the same, with the same subject, there, therefore it's an easy case. Here is a different example in which we have the same content, but a different photo format. It is considered also to be a duplicate, so we need to remove one of them. A more difficult example is the same subject, but taken with different cameras. It is considered also to be a duplicate. And the last example of near duplicates is when we have the same subject, but from different point of views or with different depth of field. It is considered to be also a duplicate and we need to remove one of them. And this is an example when the content is quite different within the photos, we consider them to be as unique photos and we keep both of them. Another application is uh, photo selection with aesthetics we uh, are able to compute the aesthetical values of the photos uh, using deep learning models. Therefore, why do we need this? Uh, we need this to propose book covers or photo candidates for full pages in a photo set, or suggest premium products with the most beautiful pictures from a set. By analyzing the behavior of the users, uh, we noted that there is a strong correlation between uh, the pictures that people put in highlight in their albums and uh, the aesthetical values of the photos. I've talked about aesthetics, but what is aesthetics? Aesthetics is really a subjective task, 
since uh, it represents the beauty of the photo, which can be perceived differently by different persons. We also use the um, uh, aesthetics to uh, choose the best photo from a cluster of duplicates. Another important application is customer segmentation. Our products are generic and we don't have a lot of products and they don't offer a lot of information about the customer behavior. Uh, let's take here the example of a generic photo book and two different users which uploaded a lot of photos but, and they have a different behavior. Uh, one of them uh, is, loves to travel, therefore takes a lot of pictures of traveling. The other one takes a lot of pictures at wedding or maybe it's his wedding. And in order to propose him adapted products, we need to know the content of their photos. Customer segmentation is also used to do targeted uh, marketing campaigns on different topics. Uh, therefore, uh, user, uh, user uploads photo photo photos on the PhotoBox websites, and in the back end, we analyze their photos using a deep learning um, uh, engine. This uh, classification is adapted to, uh, what, to the content of the photo uh, of the client. Then uh, we use this content, we aggregate them uh, into a vector, a normalized vector, uh, all the photos of the users. This gives a an accurate representation of the visual content of the photos. Then we uh, concatenate uh, to, the no to the normalized vector profile information such as age, gender, uh, and cameras, and fed this information into a segmentation algorithm. This segmentation algorithm groups together users uh, which have uh, common interests. The, concatenation, uh, the combination of content and profile information proves to be accurate since we have meaningful clusters. Uh, just to give you an example also, that uh, an user is, uh, a, the appartenance of a user to a certain cluster is not stable through time since it may start to, uh, to a young uh, friend's clusters and go to marriage, uh, then change to a couple holidays, then to marriage. Here uh, is an example of a customer that has a keen interest in marriage, therefore uh, we propose him adapted products. Thank you. I'll let Adrian to enter to present you more details about the architectural choices which allows to process massive amount of data. Thank you, Christina. So, as we've seen, um, it's uh, really important for us to be able to extract efficiently machine learning results to be able to facilitate the user journey. Uh, so, now we'll focus on how we manage to build an architecture that allows to do that on time for the user. So, first, let's go back to the main user journey. So, there are three main steps for uh, the user. The, um, usually, he will arrive with uh, a set of uh, pictures, select a few hundred, let's say, and then start to upload. And then once the upload is finished, uh, he can start to create his product via uh, website editor. So as we want to integrate our uh, photo analysis or machine learning results, uh, we need to do it in parallel just to be sure that we don't uh, make the user wait more time. Um, we have another constraint that is represented with this red line. So again, as we don't want the user to wait additional time after his photo upload, once he is ready to, to click and enter the, the creation process, we need to have all our uh, photo analysis ready. So if it's taking too long, we're going to lose like, some results on uh, some pictures. So our main objective is really to extract all the machine learning results before the, the customer is entering the creation process. So we'll quickly see how the, how the system is architecture, architectured. Uh, so from the upload page, uh, we have the, the process that we've seen, so the upload of the picture on the server. And at the same time, we are sending to the photo analyzer GPU cluster uh, the IDs of the photos we want to analyze. And this photo analyzer system will 
uh, post the machine learning result into a DynamoDB table. So nothing complicated. Uh, we will see now the inside of the photo analyzer. So we have a common job queue where we've put all the IDs of the photos that we want to analyze. And this, um, this job will go through different blocks that will take care of specific tasks. So the first is to retrieve the, the image from the, the, the upload servers. So download the image, format it into NumPy, which is a library to load images into a numeric format, and store it on a disk. And then the, the process worker, which is in charge of uh, analyzing the photos with uh, neural networks, uh, loads the image and uh, calculate the machine learning uh, results. Once this result is ready, it's sent to the output worker, which is more or less in charge of just posting it on DynamoDB. There's additional disk cleaning, but it's not really important here. Um, a few things to notice here is that we have a, um, a simple Redis queue system. And what we really want to achieve here is to uh, optimize our GPU efficiency. So the process worker is working on GPU to have a fast neural network prediction. And this is really the key component uh, we want to optimize. So for those who don't know, uh, you have some optimized uh, size of uh, number of images that you can put in the GPU so that it runs faster per image. So wh one thing we didn't mention on the previous slide is why we had this, um, this uh, small blocks of uh, processing. The main idea is to, is to be able to, to have a different number of workers depending on, on uh, the CPU intensity of the task. For example, downloading images and uh, loading them into a specific format uh, takes much more CPU. You have maybe mo uh, more uh, wait time to retrieve the image from the server. So th therefore, you need uh, more workers. Uh, on, the, uh, on the opposite side, just posting the, the result on the, on the table is much easier, and you don't need so many output workers, for example. And on the two process workers in the middle, it's really where you have, let's say, the bottleneck, because you have one GPU, and you cannot have so many process workers working on the same uh, instance because of the limitation of the RAM. So again, here, we try to set this number of workers to maximize the GPU efficiency. Uh, you, something that could be, a uh, mistake that could be done is to have too many uh, ima uh, input workers downloading images and just not enough uh, efficiency on the, on the process workers. So, so far, we have seen only one uh, example on a single instance, and we'll quickly see how we, how we do our scaling. So, from the common job queue, we have our single instance. And if at some point uh, the GPU usage of this instance uh, goes beyond the threshold, we just have an auto scaling room creating a new instance that will feed on the same job queue. So, nothing complicated, just that we need to have a custom GPU monitoring just to be sure uh, we know when the, the system is uh, overloaded. So, just a quick presentation about what we are using to do that. So we rely on uh, Amazon Web Services and Python to do much of the, of the code. As we've seen before, we're using Redis for the simple queue system. For the GPU processing, so neural network and um, image loading, we're using NumPy, Cafe, and MXNet. And uh, for everything that has to do with uh, Web APIs, we are using a classical uh, stack, uh, Nginx, G-Unicorn, and Flask in Python. And just to give you a, a small idea of how much time we need to process a uh, picture, it's around 100 milliseconds, and we, do, uh, cal four dif uh, we calculate four different models, deep learning models. 
Okay, so so far we have seen uh, a simple but scalable architecture. Um, so this is the architecture that we are using to process uh, our million or billion uh, photos. So it's simple but efficient. Uh, it's possible to have an hybrid cloud and internal infrastructure. So we we've talked about the auto scaling, but it's possible to have uh, internal instances doing processing, and it r greatly reduces uh, the bill that you can have on Amazon. Uh, we've added seamless model addition, so there is no supposition on how many models you have. It just takes a bit more time to, to process uh, more, more machine learning models. On the negative parts, however, uh, as we are using GPUs, uh, usually you have a bigger snapshot with all the libraries, and bigger snapshots mean that your instance will, may, will take more time to start. Uh, at the same time, if you are using GPU instances, they are much more expensive, so you need to be careful on how you scale and not to to, uh, to put too many instances that will basically do nothing. And the final thing, uh, the microservices is, uh, are a bit more trouble, uh, difficult to troubleshoot. So just a, a thing to notice. So uh, just a quick conclusion on, on this presentation. So we have seen so far uh, how machine learning helps uh, automate manual tasks at Photobox. Uh, our architecture is simple, but uh, we manage to analyze our billion photos that we have every year uh, with deep learning models. So uh, this is, uh, this is uh, functional for us. So this is all for our presentation. So if you have questions, now is the time. Thank you. Sorry. Um, thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Um, how did you manage to get the, the, the info about uh, how much your GPU are um, overloaded or something like that? How do you pop instance in uh, Amazon? Okay. Uh, in, in fact, it's, uh, it's not really complicated with uh, Amazon. So you just need to, uh, to add um, custom monitoring. So you just have... Um, if, if you know, uh, do you know a bit about uh, NVIDIA, the system that you have around? You can just, you have a tool that tells you how much uh, GPU usage that you have. You just need to take that number, uh, send it to uh, Cloud, uh, CloudWatch, and then this metric can be used to trigger uh, auto-scaling events. So for example, for us, I think it's when we reach about 50% uh, GPU usage, it means that we are in danger of uh, of having too, too many requests on this instance, so it means that we need another instance. Yeah? Uh, why don't we use TensorFlow? Yes, why didn't you chose to use TensorFlow for image processing, for data mining? Uh, it just, uh, I, I think it's, uh, this project is uh, something like three, three, year, uh, three years old. So at that time, I think TensorFlow wasn't so, so developed as today. So that's why we, we have a cafe, firstly. But uh, even if it's not as uh, popularized, for example, it was still a very production tested cafe. It was used by, the, by a lot of companies. Mm -hmm. So it's still quite efficient. Thank you.